Hello and welcome. While looking back retrospectively at what we thought the new decade of the 2020s was going to be like, you know, feature films and animated sitcoms like The Jetsons have past predicted a futuristic and utopian future. Now, as we all know, our experience with the year 2020 has been anything but. With uh, Instead of um, flying cars, we've had to go back to the basics of being reminded how to wash our hands. <laughs> that being said, our experiences with COVID-19 have meant that our lives have increasingly become dependent on technology within a very short time frame. So with a stronger emphasis on our health and well-being, telehealth consultations have become the only access for many Australians to medical professionals. But the question is, what is telehealth and how can we adapt our lifestyles and become acquainted and familiarise ourselves with using it? Well, lucky for us, today we're speaking with Francesca Finzone. Now, Frances Francesca sorry, is a co-founder and chief operating officer of UMBO, a social enterprise that addresses one of Australia's hidden problems, um, which is access to speech therapy and occupational therapy in regional Australia. Now, she is passionate about bringing health services to children in rural communities and removing um, social inequalities. Now, Francesca has a ton of qualifications, including a master's degree in international and public health from the University of Sydney and she has over 12 years experience in working in not-for-profit organizations in overseas countries like Pakistan, UNICEF in India and Canteen here in Australia and she also teaches at the University of New South Wales at the, so at the Centre for Social Impact and of course she's a busy mother of three children, one which has received speech um, pathology. Um, is that from a remote perspective as well? Is that through telehealth services? Or not? That, no. was prior, that was kind of prior to telehealth kind of um, being a bit more popular. So that, that was in a face-to-face. -face in a face-to-face. -face. Well, thank you for joining us. How are you? Thank you. Good. I love how you pronounce my name. It well, always uh, makes me feel very Italian. <laughs> that's just the thing. I love saying it, Francesca Pinzone. But if I'm going to say it like an Aussie, I'm going to say Francesca Pinzone. So exactly. really, and I always get stuck because I really just want to just say it in the best way possible, which is just that big and beautiful, bold way. So Francesca. Been Hello. Thank you for joining us. How are you? I'm really well. Nice to talk to you again, Rachel. And thank you so much for having me on again. It's been a uh, really <laughs> interesting couple of months, I think, since we last spoke. And yeah. Yeah, lots of things have happened, but um, I know you guys are back into lockdown in Melbourne and that's really challenging. I'm in Sydney, so it's a bit, bit different, but um, <laughs> yeah, we're here. Well, that's it. Exactly. In Melbourne, we're in the midst of stage four COVID restrictions, which for anyone outside of Victoria is a little like we're all collectively being kept prisoner in our houses under house arrest <laughs> with a curfew and the restrictions that we're all under at the moment. Of course, all with good reason, and that's to uh, stop the, the spread of the virus. Um, but honestly, I, I tell you what, if you had told me 12 months ago that the only access I personally would have um, with certain medical professionals was going to be via telehealth, I honestly would have thought that you were crazy. But, you know, here we are. So I'd just love to know initially, <laughs> as we were just saying earlier, just the fact that technology has actually changed the way that we are living under well, within such a short time frame. I'd love to know initially, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it's been such an interesting learning curve, I think, for so many people. And I feel like um, in terms of telehealth, we've been talking about this for quite a few years now. And actually, telehealth is not new. It has been going on for decades, um, particularly with the Royal Flying Doctors Service, who have been uh -huh. doing um, phone and radio consults for years um, for people who are, you know, living in remote areas. So telehealth isn't new, but there's been a little bit of a fear, I think, around telehealth and actually can you get great outcomes from telehealth as what you would get in a face-to-face -face consultation. But what we're finding now, I think with COVID and having to go online, we've all worked out we can work from home well enough with, um, with, you know, being able to tap into meetings on Zoom or um, even just doing an interview like this, you know, previously it may have had to be face to face. So I think we've all adapted really well to technology and actually what it can do for us and that we can function really well in society via technology. Uh-huh. Yes. Well, there's lots to cover um, and I've got lots of questions I want to ask you, but before we get stuck into that, we published your article and the title title is, what is telehealth and how does it work? Now, for someone who hasn't yet read the article, can you please tell us what it's about and just what inspired you to write it? Yeah. So, um, 
I guess the inspiration for me to write that article was really being able to share our knowledge around telehealth and that actually you can get really good outcomes from telehealth when you, um, it's, it's, it's a really important tool that a lot of practitioners can have in their box, kind of really in their suite of tools. But the other thing, the other reason for me, the real kind of reason to write that article is at Umbo, we really want to help people and we want to let you know that we are here and we have services that we can provide. So if you can't get access to a therapist, um, we can help you get access to a therapist and we're here to kind of support you because this is a really kind of challenging time for so many people and we're here to support. So telehealth, it's, it's I'm gonna tell you what it's not, if that's okay. And it's not simply taking what you would do in person in a clinic and popping it online. So it's not day yeah, it's not day-to-day -day practice just with Zoom or with another um, with another kind of um, uh, IT tool. What telehealth is, is actually, and the way that we work at Umbo is we work from much more of a person-centred approach. So what we do is it, within kind of this, what we call online therapy or digital practice, moving away from that telehealth maybe title sometimes because it can make people feel like it's a bit old, like they don't really understand it, is we're actually helping families work out what is best practice for them and what's going to work for their family the most. So it moves away from this clinical model, this typical model where I'm the clinician and I know what's best for you and I'm going to help tell you what's best for you. It's a much more of a medical model that we've been a little bit used to and it actually is putting the person at the centre of everything they do and saying, actually, what are the goals that you want for you, yourself and your family? What is it that you need? And we work off those goals. So that's person-centred practice and digital practices using tools like you know, well, not Zoom, we don't use Zoom for privacy issues, but um, using kind of different channels, it's using other kind of online components, it's using the phone, whatever it might be, in order to undertake therapy. And the other kind of unique, yeah, and the other unique part about it is, when we look at the previous way of delivering therapy, often in a clinic, um, which don't get me wrong, obviously has its um, a huge amount of merit and it works really well for a lot of people. But what we do, we actually help families and we coach the people around that particular kind of client or patient. So say it was your son, we may work with your preschool teacher, his preschool teacher, with his school teacher, with maybe the GP, somebody within that kind of network of family, it doesn't always have to be the parent, to actually kind of almost upskill them into therapy and help them on a day-to-day -day basis work with that child. Mm -hmm. And so there's a couple of different aspects. So what we actually do is we help grow a community and their capability, but we're also asking that question, what is it that you want? What's best for your family? What works best? It's not, can I pronounce something this way? It might be, well, I really want that person to be comfortable going in and ordering a coffee in the coffee shop or a baby chino or something. Cool. So you've so, now sort of explained what it's not, but just, I guess, for more so for my simple heart and mind, could you maybe just explain what telehealth is and how does it work then in general? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so telehealth is the delivery of services basically in an online format. Okay. For us, it's around setting goals, understanding what a client needs, and then delivering that therapy almost like in this type of environment. Okay, so telehealth is like an innovative way to distribute health-related services and information via electronic te telecommunication technologies. Um, yeah. I guess overall, and one of the many benefits, of course, that it allows long distance patient and clinical contact care and advice, would you say? Absolutely. So, yeah. so generally what, um, for, I guess, all different medical practitioners, what sort of appointments can be made via telehealth then? Look, we're seeing GPs constantly doing telehealth appointments. There's some things they can't do, but a lot of um, GP appointments can be done via telehealth. Any other kind of medical professional um, can, can do appointments by telehealth. We have speech therapists, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, dietitian, nu nutrition. So there's, uh, uh, most of the allied health services can be done via telehealth. And is it common? I mean, is there many Australians currently using telehealth at the moment? Yeah, we've seen a really big rise. Um, up to, you know, 4 million Australians are currently oh, wow. using telehealth. Yeah, in April, um, studies have shown. So there's been a huge increase and uh, a much better understanding of what it actually is. Yeah, it sounds like it's one of the world's best kept secrets at the moment. Um, <laughs> so, um, and I guess one of, as you just mentioned in before, one of the most common misconceptions is that telehealth cannot be as effective as a one on one personal sessions. But I'd love to know initially, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, look, studies are showing us that you actually can get the same benefits and the same efficacy as what you would get in a clinic. And in actual fact, 
there's a lot of kind of key benefits around um, the delivery of a service um, via telehealth. And actually, just to throw it in there, our one of my co my co-founder Ed Johnson, who is a speech therapist of of uh, over ten years, has is just completing his PhD on the efficacy, comparing the efficacy of online therapy mm -hmm. and face to face, and he is proving that there is really good outcomes from um, telehealth. So, so, how would you describe then? What are the main benefits for parents and kids then? Well, look, I think that it, there's multiple benefits and a lot of them are the practicalities of day-to-day -day life. When you think about, you know, being a parent, looking, taking multiple kids to appointments, um, packing everybody in the car, the time you spend for people who live in rural and regional areas, there's a cost implication of travel. So you may have to travel four to five hours to see a therapist each way, which is not uncommon. Um, so there's multiple benefits. One is around time and the availability of clinicians, but also I can do a therapy session at 8 a.m. and my son's still in his pajamas and that's no problem. And I might well be in my pajamas too, who knows? Um, so that's one. The other part is, um, you know, obviously there's cost savings around travel and transportation. The other thing is it's, it's really good for clinicians to be able to see your child in their home environment in real time in real time so yeah you, know, you can you can describe things um and but the reality of trying to describe what they're like at dinner time but actually having the session during dinner and actually having the therapist coach you through that process during in real time. dinner yeah so for example mm -hmm. issues can be observed in real time like like with fussy eating issues at the dinner yeah. table is that what you're saying absolutely yes that's exactly what i'm saying yeah it's Continue. It, yeah, yeah, sorry. Go. yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's also that you know we can describe what our home environment is like, but actually you get a sneak peek as a clinician yeah. into you know you can see the other kids running around in the background. You can see the TV going, or someone's trying to cook dinner while doing homework, and you actually just get to know that child a little bit better because you're kind of in their home with them. Mm -hmm. But and, so. and do you have any tips how I guess you can navigate engaging telehealth consultations then, and to get the most out of them? Yeah, there's a lot of ways. And look, the therapists are so skilled at doing this. And my son now has had telehealth with um, with one of our clinicians. And at first I thought, oh, he's not going to sit there. He's going to, you know, he's not going to be engaged. But it's quite a unique experience to watch a clinician who is really skilled at talking to a child, um, not use any other kind of games or toys, just use speech, but be able to do an assessment in that online environment. It's It's quite incredible to watch a therapist be able to do that and get a really good understanding of your child out of that and then take the key pieces that they understand of your child and build on those during different sessions. Mm -hmm. So what, what are some of the more, more common challenges um, that parents and children generally face with uh, telehealth consultations? Look, sometimes we have challenges of technolo technological challenges. I think we're all seeing those. Um, you know, we all put ourselves on mute by accident. Um, and so there are tech challenges. But one thing that we learn is it doesn't always have to be video. So if you can then pick up the phone and continue your session on the phone, that's not a problem. Um, one of the accessibility challenges, particularly for families in rural and regional areas, is they may not have access to a computer or an iPad. Um, and that's why we work really closely in partnership with schools and preschools, because you would find that they would have it. Um, and so your child can have therapy during school hours, um, utilising the school's computer. So the challenges are kind of, the challenges for parents, there actually aren't many. It's actually a really incredible way to access therapy um, from your home environment. Mm -hmm. But um, for people that um, love to have that face-to-face -face contact, um, understanding in, in, in Melbourne, as an, as an example currently now, um, but in the future and or in many other sort of scenarios throughout, throughout um, Australia, there might be families that are hesitant to be able to have face-to-face -face consultations to, to, to get out of the house, um, mm. etc. Many parents and families would still be hesitant to try telehealth. So how do they actually know if it's right for them and their family then? Well, at Umbo, so what we enable families to do is have a 15-minute consult first so they can we have a consult with one of our um, teams so we can actually explain what telehealth is but mm -hmm. also to check if it is right for their family um, nine times out of ten it is it is a great option for families and if it's not going to work for a family you know there may be that a family has a child with a disability who needs to go into the hospital anyway so would prefer to wrap all those appointments up in that one kind of day or session so we can understand
understand that. But um, mostly it, it, the benefits really outweigh any kind of po- potential detractors. Mm-hmm. And the benefits being um, lifestyle benefits, as you mentioned before, it, you know, the fact that you can um, have the consultation in real time, um, that there's probably lower wait time for consultations and those types of things. How else would you describe what some of the, some of the benefits are then? The therapeutic benefits are incredible. So what we are seeing um, now, and I have a, a, a colleague who I work with whose son is receiving teletherapy. Um, she's spent a lot of time over the last couple of years doing, seeing different clinicians. But what she's finding is some of the particular things that her son is doing, early morning um, practice with the therapist, those types of things, they're the things you can't get in a clinic but they're the things you can get through teletherapy. So that's the that's kind of one of the, it's a little bit more practical, but actually is a really ther- good therapeutic benefit. And the other thing is going back to that coaching model of if you're in, a per, in person in a clinic, you're often not working with other people who are surrounding that child. Mm-hmm. Whereas when you do teletherapy, you can access multiple people that are involved in that child's life. And so therefore you can work with multiple different people if you need to, in order so they can get the best benefit. Okay. Can um, you expand on this a little bit more? What, what do you mean by this yeah so when we work from a coaching model um, what we're doing is we're we're not just always working with the parent so what we find is we we may allocate who we call a key worker and that may be a preschool teacher it may be a support coordinator or it could be the parent but we work with them not just the parents in actually delivering kind of therapy so we teach them what to do in their interim while you're not having therapy in the week between or the weeks between and those kind of practice activities that a child may do or some of the warm-up things they may do it's not always the parent doing that so what you're kind of i feel it's kind of like you're wrapping you're wrapping that child with multiple people who can help them not just one person. And so then what we do is we slowly upskill those people. So say it was a preschool teacher and we're teaching them new techniques to work with one particular child. They might identify another child who they can, you know, work with as well, or they may identify some speech issues. So you're actually kind of slowly upskilling other people into that kind of role of doing some kind of therapeutic intervention as well. So you're saying if if you see a child, is this typical for all telehealth consultations irrespective of what the um the medical profession is 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 that how it generally works for all it depends depends. this is the model that we work from at umbo so no not necessarily right so how how does it generally work i mean and what else i guess from a general perspective um in 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 speaking to joe public about telehealth that maybe they haven't used it before they're completely unfamiliar with it you know what do parents actually need to know about telehealth during the pandemic um and then also about about using telehealth after the pandemic as well. Yeah. So parents just need to know that it's it's available and it's accessible. So it will work within your lifestyle and it and it's very accessible but also that it's a really good tool to get therapy. If you can't go to a clinic, there there's there's no barriers for you to access teletherapy. I think they're the kind of key things is that it's really important for parents to try and look outside the box. I think the other thing is we're moving much more into a technological world. Like we're not, you know, we don't have to always um, uh, be, it's not even face to face. It's in person because we're face to face. And I feel like, you know, you can actually have a really good conversation or you can actually get good outcomes in this kind of environment. So it's, it's accessible, it's available, but it's also, it has really good therapeutic outcomes. And there's lots and lots of people who've been doing teletherapy or telehealth for many, many years. So it's not new. Um, it's just that it's becoming more and more mainstream that you can actually have this as an option. Post pandemic, I would probably say if, if it's working for you, there's probably no reason to change um, what you're doing. Um, we have clients who are purely, uh, well, most all our clients are purely um, using telehealth and they have been, we've been in business for a couple of years. So they have been for a couple of years pre-pandemic. Um, we even have one client, just to give you a story, we have one client who um, has travelled all around Australia receiving therapy mm-hmm. um, for over six months. So, you know, there's great things that can happen. And you mentioned earlier on about the the consultations. I mean, would you recommend that um, with families during the pandemic um, that they, once they maybe embark on trialling telehealth um, consultation with any medical professional, that they should um, um, sort of request a a, um, a consultation to see if that actually works for them? Um, I mean, like anything, when you're trying something new for the first time, obviously 
there's going to be some some bumps along the road and those types of things as well. But um, is this something that you recommend that everyone should, should be sort of trialing with any consultation and, and or like what, 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 I don't know, what advice can you sort of give for anyone sort of in that scenario, trying it for the first time as well? That may be a little yeah. bit hesitant. Yeah, I think if your situation merits a telehealth consult, so even if you were to go to a GP and you, you want to describe your symptoms, they may not need to do a physical examination. I don't know, you need to go and get a new script, all those types of things. There, there is no reason it couldn't be done over, you know, online. Um, so I think that it does enable, you know, it, I think we need to take the fear out of it there seems to be a little bit sometimes if people fear or an, and it may not be a fear of trying something new it's just a fear whether you can actually get what you need from mm -hmm. from the therapy and i think we need to strip that away a little bit and actually just say we can do this online it's a great way to actually get the services that you need you probably don't have to wait six months at a clinic there's massive waiting lists across australia for speech and occupational therapists you don't have to wait that long. Um, you know, there are people available to help you. It's just around kind of dipping your toe in the water and actually seeing you can have great benefits from it. Mm -hmm. And I guess the million dollar question really is, I mean, is there any legal issues with, uh, associated with telehealth? Um, and if so, what are they? And, and what are the existing protocols that um, any medical professional um, must sort of adhere to? And which is very important, I think, for any, any um, sort of families sort of trialing it and or, going to continue using it after the pandemic yeah so it is um there are privacy obviously um requirements that you need to meet so what we would encourage families to do and obviously I, i'm going from the assumption that the medical professionals know what they're doing here and have actually got legal advice um, and understand their risk is that um, families take a look at the privacy policy take a look at the storage of information policy that a, a clinic would have and make sure that they're across that they know the medium that it's used so we use a specific um, at umbo we use a specific teletherapy um, uh, platform we don't use Zoom because it isn't encrypted enough and it's hosted in the US and so we don't use that. Um, and so we use a different platform for that. So make sure that you've done a little bit of research, ask them for their privacy policy, make sure that they're across everything so that you feel confident when you're going in. How are they storing my information? How are they, um, are they recording the sessions and what's happening with my data? Mm -hmm. I know a lot of GPs are doing mainly phone consults as opposed to telehealth, like the online actual video consult. Um, for various different reasons around privacy and security. Mm -hmm. Okay. So aside from the legal questions, what other questions <laughs> should a parent be asking, um, I guess, with any new provider? Is there anything else you, you think, for example, I mean, are you given homework? Is that something that, that, that generally, I mean, generally when you maybe you go to see a medical professional that you, you sort of have your physio exercises or whatever it is that you have to do afterwards, but you know, what, what other sort of um, questions can you maybe suggest to family sort of, um, you know, have ready to ask as well? <laughs> yeah, I think it's really important to ask um, what is the kind of, and you'll know this after an assessment, what, after you've had that first assessment with a therapist, you'll probably know what your child needs to do and what you need to work on with your child. So there may be what we kind of call homework. Um, you know, can I just tell, I, maybe this is the best way to describe it. So what I really love about this kind of idea of person-centered practice is rather than doing an assessment and saying to the family, oh, you know, your child's having meltdowns, but what I can see is that they're actually having trouble communicating. And so let's start working on these sounds. And then you work on the sounds. That's a kind of more typical approach or, you know, what we're saying is what would make your family's life best how would it work? And it might be, well, every time um, we get in the car, we don't want to have a meltdown. And so you actually work on that as the goal, as opposed to saying, oh, here's how we pronounce these sounds, because we think that there's, an, there's a, you know, there's a link here. But actually, the problem is, it could be just, it could be something like a child not being able to communicate that they're scared of the car because of a certain reason. And so if you actually really identify, how would we make your family life better? And what is the goal we're going to work on? It, it just, it kind of flips that narrative of homework and this kind of model. And it actually is, what are all the things on a daily basis we're going to do to help make us get into the car well and have that as a good experience? And the therapist comes up with goals with the family in order to achieve that. Or it may be that yeah, your child wants to say hi to someone in the playground. So we coach your child on how to do that. Mm -hmm. And is that typical, I guess, for medical professionals using telehealth as a service to be able to provide um, 
the, the service in that way um, and or is that just sort of something that, that your organisation does? It's something we definitely do. I probably can't comment on any other organisations at this point because I think that the uptake has been so new. So people probably, you know, like widespread and new. So people probably haven't quite, um, you know, we don't really know any studies into that, but definitely in Umbo, that's how we, that's kind of how we work. Okay, great. So I guess that being said, what are some of the other challenges, I guess, um, of the current healthcare system for parents that, that you're trying to change with Umbo then? So there are a number of challenges that we see within the current healthcare system. And the reason UMBO exists is because we see health inequality in access to healthcare and it doesn't sit well with us. And so that's why we decided to start our organisation as a social enterprise and speech and occupational therapy is one way to change that system. So what typically happens, and particularly you see this inequality um, in more regional and rural and specifically in remote areas as well, there's a huge disparity in access to services. So what we see is that people may get a therapist fly in and fly out of of an area once every kind of four, six weeks. Um, So you may get therapy, but it's not in an ongoing basis. And then you may also have a different therapist each time. So you lack that continuity of care. And when you're working with children, and we work with adults as well, but when you work with children or children with disabilities, it's really important to have a good continuity of care, Um, not only for just kind of rapport between the therapist and the family, but also for, you know, delivery of outcomes. And so what we see is this inability to access services in a timely manner. Currently, if you live in Dubbo, there's an 18-month wait list to see a therapist. Wow. And so we're working in Dubbo um, with a preschool with over 60 children uh, who, who, you know, were on a wait list for 18 months. The other problem that we see is that there's a lot of um, messages, and they're really accurate messages, that says early intervention is key. But if you can't access a therapist and everyone's saying you need to get this problem sorted by the time that they're five and you're on a two-year wait list to see a therapist, you're in panic mode as a parent. Your stress and anxiety thinking, I actually cannot get the service my child needs is really high. So what we're trying to do is minimise all that as well as some other kind of practical things. But really the healthcare system isn't set up for people in rural and regional areas very well. Mm -hmm. Um, and is it really important for families to find a provider who's actually skilled in telehealth? Is there a difference in, pro- I mean, in providing face-to-face consultations and then sort of being equipped um, and experienced to, to be able to deliver services in that medium from a telehealth perspective? What are your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There is a huge difference. And what we are trying to do is help upskill as many therapists as as, um, as we possibly can. So there, there are many, many differences. And um, my colleague, Ed Johnson, is wonderful to talk to about this because he can um, explain exactly. It's not just transferring what happens in a clinic environment onto an online environment. It's much more, um, it's much more detailed than that. What we are trying to do is, oh, sorry. <laughs> you know, I was just going to ask, so families, when they are um, new to telehealth, and how would they sort of be able to um, ask, I guess, a, um, a medical professional in, in a nice way and or to, to be able to suss out um, their experience in delivering telehealth services? Yeah, I think it's just really important to ask the question, how long have you been undertaking telehealth? And I think for certain, certain, um, you know, if you're looking at an ongoing therapeutic relationship, like a speech or occupational therapist or a physiotherapist, it is really important, you know, it, it's probably more important than maybe, you know, a GP consult, for example, where you maybe don't have that ongoing um, goal setting therapeutic relationship. So just ask the question, how long have you been undertaking teletherapy? Have you done any training in it? You know, what, why, why did you do teletherapy? Because what we really don't necessarily want to see is um, clinics who bring on um, uh, using telehealth. And then when the pandemic's over, it just goes to the wayside. Because actually, it's a really great tool that a lot of therapists can kind of have in their toolbox in order to deliver another type of service. You could do a blended kind of service of tele- telehealth and face-to-face or in-person consultation. Um, So yeah, for families, just ask a couple of questions, find out more. Um, We offer training to therapists. We do an online um, training package where therapists can be trained in online therapy, just so that, you know, we are trying to expand the knowledge of of teletherapy and help as many people as we can. Mm -hmm. So I guess in an ideal world, um, you know, really what does the future of telehealth um, and health look like to you? And, you know, and really how far are we off from that reality? Um, And what do we need to do to get there then? 
you know, the pandemic has been a real tipping point, I think, in, in this um, environment. And I hope it's changed this mi the mindset and maybe the narrative around telehealth that actually it's, you know, it's a great way to deliver services. We don't want to see it go anywhere. And in fact, we want to expand it. We want to see more therapists practicing telehealth and actually um, having it, as, like I said, a part of their repertoire, something that they can offer to families in need. It also means that, you know, there's um, hundreds of thousands of people living in regional areas with a disability who don't get the services they need. And we can look at NDIS uptake of um, plan funds. And in some areas, it's 25%, which means 75% of the money that they have been allocated is unable to be spent because there's no services. And the highest is around 65%. So it just tells us that services aren't there. So what we want to see is this expansion of services, expansion of telehealth, so we can reach more and more people to have the services they need. And um, from a regional perspective, as opposed to being on a 12-month waiting list, let's say if you, if you live in Dubbo, as you've just suggested, you pretty much would be able to get um, access to a medical professional anywhere in Australia provided you have any tele, like telecommunications and or a phone line or whichever medium you're using um, within a week or within a few days type of things, that that's what you're saying it, overall. That this is, so from that perspective, it, it really does expand the opportunity for, for people to be able to have access to quality services right throughout Australia. Totally. Absolutely. That's exactly what it does. And that's what we're trying to do. Reduce this inequality that exists based on location. You know, it shouldn't, it doesn't have to be like that. There are technologies available that we need to tap into to make sure that people have equitable access. So how do we change this then? How do we actually make it more viable and accessible for all Australians then? Uh, this is where, you know, it's trying to change a system is, is complex. It's tricky. The paradigm it's shift. Yeah. Paradigm shift and, you know, we need to make sure that we approach this with a, with a real kind of um, space of critical thinking and understanding what the system is that we're playing in. So when we look at something like the, the health system and the, you know, um, how it interlinks with disability and, um, and the government and, you know, there's, it's really complex. It's really complex. Um, but it's an important shift and it's a really important conversation we need to have. And we, you know, we need to advocate for families living in rural and regional areas. We need to say that, you know, this isn't okay, um, that they don't have access to services. So um, what we've seen happen is like the changes to Medicare since um, COVID-19 is that prior to this, telehealth was only available for psychologists in order um, to build, and then it increased to GPs and actually it has expanded to speech and occupational therapy services, which means that people can actually get rebates on their therapy, which has never happened before. And in fact, we had an internal conversation about this in January and we talked about it just would never happen. It would never become, um, you know, go on Medicare and then look what's happened. <laughs> So we have to change the system and we just have to do it one step at a time. But we also have to really be conscious of our ability to advocate for people who need assistance. Mm. It definitely is the future and, and, and we, we need to be pushing forward um, with this. This has um, been a real eye opener. I've definitely learned a lot listening to you today. For anyone watching or listening, how would you, I guess, summarise what your key messages are for in, in, any of our audience? Oh, that's a big question for me. <laughs> I'm not very good at summarising. Look, I think that um, don't, be f don't be scared of telehealth. It's not new. It's been around for a long time. There's incredible outcomes that you can have from that. Um, but also, you know, we, we don't just want to work in the, in the model that we've been working before. We want to work in a model where actually the person who is receiving therapy, we're asking them what they need and we're working towards goals that suit them and their family. So, you know, get in contact. We're happy to talk to you all the time. Um, we, we have clinicians or we can share with you people, other people who are working in this space if that's what you want. So, yeah, take the first step because we're here. We're ready to kind of provide services, but we're also ready to just tell you more about, you know, what you can actually get out of telehealth. That's wonderful. And if anyone's got any other questions and or want to reach out to you guys um, after this interview, whereabouts can they find you? Yeah, please go to our website. So www.umbo.com.au and that's U-M-B-O. Um, we have clinicians who are available to talk to you. I'm very happy to talk to anyone. I know what it's like when you've got three kids dragging them into a clinic for therapy. <laughs> I know, I've been there. Um, and I tell you, it is easier. There, there is an easier way.
There is. <laughs> We've definitely opened up the eyes um, and the minds of, of many people. Um, and thank you um, for this introduction talk um, and discussion on telehealth today. It's been wonderful. Take care and uh, can't wait for our next chat. Take care, stay safe. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Everyone.